Red and blue lights flash behind the Honda SUV. The woman driving sees them. She was driving the speed limit. She didn't run the red light. The cruiser stopped behind her as they waited for the light to turn green. What else had she forgotten? The man in the passenger seat screams at her as he shoves his clothes into the plastic garbage bag. He opens the bottle of ammonia, splashing it as she shoves her foot into the accelerator. The car fills with the smell of ammonia as she weaves in and out of traffic. Losing them is not as easy as it's made to seem in the movies. The two scream at each other as the man tries to get the gun apart, but her driving doesn't make it easy and his back is starting to hurt. He is due for more medicine. The pain was growing out of control and the weaving caused him to jerk from side to side. The police chase lasted several miles before finally ending at a strip mall just off of the highway. Before a command could be given, the man jumps from the passenger door. He was naked from top to bottom, except for the adult diaper. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight we are going to talk about a case so bizarre it takes hearing it more than once to believe that this didn't come from the silver screen or from the mind of a brilliant crime thriller. I will say the first time I heard of this case, it did actually come from a best-selling author who had jumped into the world of true crime. James Patterson released a series of true crime nonfiction in 2018 just before the release of his ID channel show, Murder is Forever. Cases like this somehow manage to stay under the radar. It's not for the lack of details. This has plenty of details. It's not because this case had gone cold, because this case didn't have a chance to grow cold. Stick with me, because tonight, it's going to be one hell of a ride. Warning. This case depicts graphic detail of attempted murder and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen for you or with you. Good evening, everybody. True Crime Librarian here. I've got a little bit of business to discuss before we get into tonight's case. The librarian has launched an all-new Christmas shirt and hoodie just in time for the holidays. You can sneak over to the True Crime Librarian merch store. The link is found on my Facebook and Instagram. And if you would like to help the show out and get something in return, this is the perfect way to do so. Go snag your shirt before they're gone and wear it to your favorite Christmas party. I promise it is going to slay. Make sure you are following me on Facebook and Instagram so you never miss an update on a case or what is going on in the life of the librarian. Enough of this business. Let's get to why you're all here tonight. The true crime. My little true crime nerds, we're going to start in 2009 with Andrew Schmoll and his wife, Alicia Peer. They take a walk down the aisle to say their vows. The two had met in Indiana Law School, both of them attending. Andrew attended thanks to the military. He had joined the Army as a way to pay for law school. And Alicia was there of uh, private. I mean, um, she went on her own. She didn't join the military. There wasn't anybody really paying her way through this. And the pair met. Here's the thing. Alicia is said to be social. She even ran a blog while she was in law school called Silly Little Law Student. It was her way to kind of vent off what was going on with studies or lectures or just the tension of exams. But she also would talk about her social life and she could be quite ugly as well. She posted a picture of a friend or a person, let's say a person, because it's not a friend, and she said some negative things about her on the blog. Alicia had no qualms. She'd say what was on her mind and that was that. And that makes 
sometimes for a great lawyer. They love to debate. They love to socialize. They love to speak and be heard. And Alicia wanted that. I mean, she proved it through having a blog that, you know, people enjoyed going and looking at. It wasn't something that blew up and was a giant success on the internet. But if you know Alicia and she promoted it, you heard of the blog. Well, Andrew, he was a little bit different. He was more reserved. Um, many describe him kind of as a mystery. He just kind of sat back and watched how people worked, how people socialized, how people mingled. He was a people watcher. And so for the, the pair to get together, it was very much opposites attract. And for them, it worked in the moment. It's not that Andrew was so different that he didn't have friends, because he did. His mom says he used to have a lot of friends in high school, close friends. He participated in football. He played chess. He was out there socializing, but he did not open up until he understood the situation he was in. And that, again, also makes for a great attorney because they have to sit back and they need to look for the right details. So these two being in law school was right up their alley. And when they met, it was instant. They fell in love. Now, Andrew, he had recently been divorced. He did marry one time before, right at the beginning of law school, but it was short-lived and he moved on and she moved on. The same year that Andrew and Alicia married, they also walked the stage and received those very coveted law diplomas. And it wasn't long before the two had headed out into the world of working class people and landed a couple jobs. Now, because Andrew joined the army as a means to get to go to law school, he began practicing law with the military. And he was an army lawyer on active duty officer with the Judge Advocate General Corps. He would prosecute those who committed crimes within the military. Andrew did post on like his LinkedIn account or one of those kind of like, here's my resume kind of thing. You know those sites I'm talking about? He had one and he posted on there and this kind of made me take a step and go, what? It is said that Andrew had a role in prosecuting military members, especially those involved in electronic information. He was able to give advice on how to search those hard drives and emails. But then he makes this claim. Now, take it with a grain of salt because that's what I'm doing. I can't find anything to back this claim, but he did and he put it out there. He said that he, quote, authorized the search of email accounts for Chelsea Manning. Now, we all know that Chelsea went under a very publicized scrutiny with the military and sensitive information. He says he took part in taking her down. Now, I don't believe that any more than, you know, I believe there's a man in the moon. But he claims it, so we're going to run with it. No other source, none, not one that I found corroborated what he had stated. So up to you, my true crime nerd. Do you believe him? I don't think I do. Alicia, she found a job as an immigration attorney, and they for, for being a newlywed couple who are just starting out, they were doing great, so it seemed, until Andrew was going through some training in the military, and it was a cold morning, and it was up close to the Virginia area is where they moved off to after law school. And Andrew slipped on a patch of ice and fell. And when he did so, he jarred something in his back. And he began having excruciating back pain. It never seemed to actually get better. It just continuously grew worse. And for anybody who has ever suffered from back pain, you know what I'm talking about. I, I'll contest to it. There are days where my back pain is worse than it was the day before, and then I have days where it's better. Luckily for me, I have a great neurosurgeon, and I've had some success with surgery. Unfortunately, Andrew did not, 
And in 2012, after it was very noticeable that his back wasn't getting any better, it was just going to get worse, he took medical discharge from the military, which automatically put him on disability, and he was no longer working in any law firm. It left Alicia. I mean, she had to go out. I mean, she knew they, the ink on their diplomas is barely even dry. And her husband has suffered this injury, and now she is the sole breadwinner of the home. And that, they don't have children. Great. Had they had children, that could have been even more strenuous on them. But because they didn't, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Let's just put it that way. Andrew was only bringing in about $1,100 a month in his disability, which when you're living on the East Coast, if any of you are there, you can contest that it's not, it's not enough. It's not enough for a two-week paycheck, let alone oh, an entire month. So Alicia, she had to find a better paying job. And she had switched over to the firm Bean, Kinney, and Corman. And this is where she was hired as an intellect property attorney. Now, not many of us are going to know exactly what that is. I didn't. Had to set out into the world of Google and figure this out. So an intellectual property attorney, they tend to handle matters such as patents, copyright, trademark law, licensing, franchising, distribution, technology transfers, and trade secret projects. Obviously, the librarian needs to go and find herself an intellectual property attorney. We need to trademark a few things. I didn't know that's what they were called, but that is what they are called. And Alicia, she was hired by a gentleman named Leo Fisher. Leo Fisher was a managing partner at the time that he hired Alicia, and he saw great potential in her. She was hungry. She was willing to learn. She, she wanted to make a difference and she wanted to help people. He saw the potential there. She had it. He just knew he had found himself a little gem in the rough. She was going to be it for him. He was going to groom her, really make her something productive within the firm. He just had that feeling, and that's who Leo Fisher is. Let me introduce you to Leo. He is a 61 years old. He has a wife, Sue Duncan. They had been married for 40 plus years at this point, and Sue had recently retired from a financial career. Leo, he, he was like most men. He wasn't quite ready to give up his career. And so he was still practicing law and he was still going into the firm. And he's just, he was a kind hearted person. If you walked in and you told him you needed the shirt off his back, he would have handed it to you without a, a question, without hesitation. He was just that kind of person when he met Alicia. Now, when Alicia would get up and she'd get ready to go to work over at Bean, Kinney, and Corman, Andrew would get up with her. He would spend the first three hours of the morning in a warm to hot bathtub. It seems like he needed it to remove what stiffness had created overnight of him laying in, you know, positions that were not exactly great for the alignment in his back. If you've ever looked up what it's like to lay down flat on your back on a mattress, not good for you. Not Laying on the side, not good for you. Laying on your stomach, definitely not good for you. We, our spines are not built to use the mattress. However, the fluffy comfortness of it, we still use them. So, good or bad, we still lay in them. And, and Andrew was the same. He didn't want to sleep on the floor. Who wants to sleep on a hard surface? And the old adage that a hard surface is best for the back, not necessarily true. If you'll ditch a pillow, or two, probably going to get some better alignment and it won't feel as bad. But for Andrew, nothing worked. So for three hours in the morning, he would get up and he would soak in the tub. And this would allow him to complete a few tasks around the house, but not many. He was on some strict medication regimen. And when I talked about strict, I'm talking strict. 
this is this is his shopping list, if you want to call it, of pain medication. He was on fentanyl patches. That's a narcotic, a very strong narcotic. If you have any kind of knowledge into the drug world, the prescription drug world, you know what fentanyl is. We call it the Michael Jackson drug. It is the drug that was being administered to him when he passed away. And here's Andrew. He's got it in patches and he can throw them on similar to a quit smoking patch and it will deliver fentanyl to his system at a slow rate as it's absorbed. So it's not as fast as being IV dripped into your vein, but for home administration, this is the best possibility. Here's the thing with fentanyl. The moment it, your body stops receiving the drug, the side effects or the, the effect of relief immediately starts to deteriorate. It is something that needs to be constant in order to be effective. And for Andrew, if he didn't have a patch on, things could get bad for him. He was on Dilaudid or hydromorphine for those of you who don't know what Dilaudid is. Dilaudid is very popular in the street drug world. It is highly sought after and it's not cheap to get your hands on. Even if you are one of those people who legitimately go out and receive a prescription for Dilaudid, it's, you've got some, got some hoops to jump through before you can actually take the medication. It is prescribed to treat moderate to severe pain. Where fentanyl is severe pain only, they do not give you fentanyl if you have a toothache. Or, mm, I'm out of kink to nerve in my neck. They don't give you fentanyl for this. They give you fentanyl for those who are living in pain at a 10, a constant 10, every single day. Well, he's taking fentanyl patches, right? He's got these patches on his body to help alleviate some of the pain. He's also taking Dilaudid. That's a, that's a hell of a combination right there. Any person, any regular person, would not be able to function under the combination of these two drugs. But Andrew did every single day. He put his fentanyl patch on after he got out of the tub. He took his Dilaudid and he replaced the patch when need be, took another Dilaudid at the new time frame. And he was well on his way of being a prescription pain junkie. And that's horrible. But when you're going through something like back pain, the constant is what makes it the worst, is what makes it hurt more than anything. He was on clonidine patches and also these patches. So he's got a fentanyl patch, he's got a clonidine patch. Clonidine helps control blood pressure. For a patient who has chronic pain, they tend to carry or exhibit a higher blood pressure because when a person is in pain, that bearing down and that tensing to, to protect the wounded area causes your body to increase its blood pressure. So he's on clonidine patches. He's also on a second pain patch. The prescription name is not listed. I could not find it anywhere. But he had three patches on his body at this point, right? Every day in order just to get up and make it from the bed to the couch. He's also taken Tizodine. Tizodine is a muscle relaxer that treats muscle spasms. Sounds like to me that somewhere in his injury, his muscles like to spasm back there around his spine. And with your sciatic nerve being right there and also being very sensitive to any kind of pressure, I could see where this comes into play. He's on sucrophate. This is used to treat ulcers. And by just the list of medication I've given you at this point, this man needed more than just a little bitty pill to take to treat ulcers. He needed some kind of coating on his stomach at all points. He was on gabapentin. Gabapentin is an anticonvulsant, but it is off-label prescribed for nerve pain. I've been on gabapentin for sciatic pain. It's not fun at all. And when you are combined, I couldn't even imagine 
taking half the pain medication he did because I don't need that much. He did. I don't know what he did. It's never really put out there what the actual injury was, but it was his back. He also had to do Toradol injections, and Toradol is an NSAID. So it's a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug, and that is to alleviate any inflammation going on in the body. Andrew was too squeamish to do this, so Alicia had to give him his injections daily in his thighs. He couldn't do it. He was on lisinopril, another high blood pressure medication. It sounds to me that he needed both of them just to keep him out of stroke range due to the amount of pain he was in. He was on Cymbalta. Cymbalta is an antidepressant, and if you're chronically in pain, over time, that wears you down mentally, so it doesn't surprise me to see an antidepressant in his medication list. But Cymbalta is also used to treat nerve pain, so two birds, one stone. He was on Sumatriptan, which is used to treat migraines and cluster headaches. And then he took the liberty of adding in a couple over-the-counter medications. He took Pepto-Bismol. Again, I'm assuming that is to help alleviate some of the symptoms that were coming from the ulcers and keep his stomach lined with something so that the medication and the stomach acid just didn't eat, eat through itself. He was on Exlax. If you are on the amount of narcotic medications that he is, you're going to need something to keep things moving. He was on NyQuil. I, all of these over-the-counter I'm kind of giving you a what I thought he might be taking it for. Uh, that's not a guarantee. I have no idea what he was taking it for. He refuses to talk about any of his medication, whether it's prescription or over-the-counter. But with NyQuil, most people don't use it for a cold. Some people are like, mm, that's going to help me sleep tonight. I'll just take a little sippy sip. I'm sure with his pain, he wasn't getting the adequate amount of sleep, so his mind probably went to just knock me out. He was taking Benadryl. Again, I would say it's probably for the drowsiness side effect that comes with Benadryl. And then he was on medication patches um, that he would put over the affected areas, like Icy Hop or Capsations or... Whatever kind of, you, you've seen them in Walmart or your local grocery store or wherever. They are nothing more than to simulate heat and relief. Most people feel like that if they can feel the heat, they have the relief. In 2014, Alicia had been with the firm for two years at this point. The once eager, promising lawyer was beginning to deteriorate either due to the stressors with her husband and his worsening condition, or due to the fact that the amount of stress that was coming from not being able to carry the load of being the sole breadwinner in the home. It doesn't matter. Either way, Alicia was beginning to miss meetings. She was beginning to miss deadlines. And the partners, they were talking, and the talk was not good. And the blowback, it was starting to come back on Leo. And so they had come to him and expressed their concerns, and Leo assured them that it would get better. But Leo found something out. Leo found out that Alicia had listed her husband, Andrew Schmoll, as an attorney at the firm on their mortgage application. Andrew is not practicing law. He is disabled. To further this incident, Leo also found out that not only was her husband listed as an employee, but that she had impersonated a human resource employee when the bank called to confirm the employment. No, 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 no. Shame, shame. Alicia was reprimanded and then sent home, and Leo told her he needed to contemplate her future with the firm. And this upset her. I mean, she's the only one bringing in income and if she loses her job what are they going to do how is this how is she going to provide for them because andrew's 1100 dollars a month probably didn't even come in a rent check so what are they going to do and so 
According to the couple's cell phone records, this whole impersonating a human resource employee was Andrew's idea. He texted her something along the lines of, just pretend to be someone. Hell, make up an accent. Who encourages this? So the next day, Leo goes back to work and he's heading into the office. And who's there waiting on him when he gets there? Alicia and a very angry Andrew. Andrew starts to talk to Leo and he can already tell that this man is, a, he's excited, he's angry. And he so he, Leo ushers the couple into his office where Andrew begins to raise his voice. He's angry. How dare he insinuate that the couple was trying to commit mortgage fraud. Well, that's what you were doing, Andrew. You lied about your employment. Then your wife lied saying you were employed there when neither were even true. But it didn't matter. Anytime Leo tried to speak up and say anything, Andrew got louder and spoke over him until the point where Alicia told Andrew, quote, Andrew, leave now because I want to save my job. And so Andrew does. He leaves. Alicia is reprimanded yet again. But... Because Leo is such a kind-hearted person, and he's not blind, he can see what's going on with her and how her home life is, and he knows she is capable of being better. And so he flat out tells her, your job performance needs to improve. She's like, of course it will. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was letting things get to me this, the way that they are. And so... Alicia, she's allowed to stay with the firm under probationary terms. If she was to have just sneezed wrong, the partners would come down and fire her. And she's lucky that's all that happened because committing fraud like this, well, it could have landed her in jail. Instead, just landed her on probation only in her job. But by October 27th of 2014, Leo had done everything he could to help save this promising attorney. She was still missing deadlines. She was not filing things that should have been filed. She was not showing up with meetings to clients. She was leaving early. She was coming in late. Basically, she did whatever she wanted to. And at that point, it was either her job or Leo's. And Leo was like, well, sorry but I have to let you go. And we are going to, to let you go with a severance pay, which didn't have to do, but I'm sure Leo stuck his neck out for that one as well. However, he needed to follow Alicia to her desk as she packed her things up. And she cried as she was loading things into the box and she was escorted from the building. And there's Andrew waiting in the couple's Honda SUV and he sees his wife walking up with this box of stuff and it's obvious that she's been crying. And he gets out of the car and he's like, what's going on? And she was, she said, that son of a bitch fired me. And Andrew's like, they can't do that. Who fired you? And Alicia's like, my supervisor, Leo Fisher. And Andrew's like, that guy's had it out for you. He's the one that put you on probation. And she can't say anything at this point because she's crying because the only reason she lost her job was because he was being a needy, needy child. It is said that at this point, either on the way home or when they got home, but shortly after the termination, the couple sat down and decided revenge would be their best option. So 11 days later, November 9th of 2014, Sue Duncan, Leo's wife, is in the kitchen roasting a chicken for dinner. Leo is sitting in his chair in the living room uh, reading a book. It's quiet, normal evening for the couple. Their two cats are bouncing around the house, but as for anything else, it seems normal. Now, Sue does notice from the kitchen that somebody pulls into their driveway, and at first she thinks, oh, maybe they're lost, or maybe they're just, you know, looking at the map or whatever. She doesn't think anything about it until she hears the doorbell ring. And Leo, you know, he hollers out to her, you know, I've got it. And he gets up, 
and he opens the front door, and it's about 6.15 right now, and he only opens it a crack, just a little. And there's a man standing on his porch in a long black coat and a hat that is very similar to one like Indiana Jones wore in the movies. And Leo, he's, he's not really sure. He's, you know, can I help you? And then the next thing he knows is this man has shoved himself into the door, knocking Leo off his stance and falling backwards. The man enters the home, shuts the door, and he launches a taser into Leo's chest. Now, Leo, just a year prior, had had quadruple bypass surgery. So for him to have the, the jolts of the taser go through him could have been deadly right then and there. Thankfully, Leo is simply just dazed. He doesn't put up a fight when his legs are bound and his hands are bound in front of him, both with zip ties. And Sue says she remembers hearing some funny noises. So she comes into the foyer and she sees her husband on the ground and he's bound and she starts screaming. Well, here comes this man in this long coat. He comes at her, backs her into a corner, and he restrains her very similar to Leo with zip ties, with her hands in front and her feet. And the guy, well, he flashes this badge far too quickly for anybody to really know what the badge says. He says he's an agent with the Virginia SEC. Immediately, Sue knows he's lying. Okay, she comes, remember she retired. She was in, she had a career in financing. The only SEC that there is, is the federal SEC, okay? And that's Securities and Exchange Commission. They work with, in all, Sue knows he's not with Virginia SEC, as there is not one. But then the male, he, this guy, he, he you know, he's like, he's got the two on the ground in the foyer, and he goes, do you know who the Knights Templar are? Now, for all of my Dan Brown junkie readers out there, you definitely know who I'm talking about because they are part of the story with the Da Vinci Code series, okay? And you do know who the Knights Templar are. You may not remember just right now, but let me refresh your memory. They are a 12th century crusaders group and that's who Leo says. He's like, well, the Knights Templar, they're that 12th century. And, and the guy's like, no, 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 no. The Knights Templar is in a, a crusading group. They're a drug cartel. And Leo's like, what the hell is he talking about? Right? And so then the guy says that supposedly Leo had put a hit out on one of the members of the Knights Templar cartel for $370,000. Of course, Leo, he is appalled at this point. He's like, do you know who I am? I'm Leo Fisher. I have no idea who anybody in any drug cartel is. And the guy goes, I know exactly who you are, Mr. Fisher. And you have inadvertently done something really bad. And so the couple's just kind of sitting in the foyer astonished as to what they're hearing from this guy. Eventually he gets them up on their feet and shuffles their way back to their master bedroom and it's in the room that he is going to interrogate the couple. So he removes his hat, he removes his jacket, and he closes the bedroom curtains before he lowers himself down into a chair. And immediately, Leo notices him wincing, as if it's painful to go from standing to sitting. Once he gets sat, this man, he starts asking questions. And they're flying out of his mouth. And Fisher can't help but think, you know, he kind of sounds like a lawyer during a deposition because of the, you know, the systematically listed questions. And this is also a second clue 
with the guarding himself as he lowers himself into the chair. Now he, he had that clue, and now he's got this one, and Leo's pretty sure he's seen this dude before. And so the guy says, is someone trying to frame you? And Leo's like, well, not that I know of. And he said, well, is there someone who would want to see you in trouble? And Leo's like, well, I don't know. You know, I don't go around making very many enemies. And then he asked Leo why he was making illegal wire transfers to offshore bank accounts. And immediately, even Sue was like, you have the wrong person. Do you even know who we are? And the guy's like, I know exactly who you are. The Virginia SEC has emails proving that Leo was in the middle of conducting shady business at the firm, and it looks like that Leo is in the positive side of this business, meaning Leo is there gaining money by committing these very questionable acts, right? But none of it's true. It's all fabricated. It's all a made-up story, and where the hell this dude comes up with it is beyond me. Now, the man, he, what he's saying, it's not making any sense. This interrogation is really weird, and I, they, the couple is having a hard time even trying to follow the list of questions that are being fired at Leo. There, it doesn't make sense, right? And then this man says, well... Somebody's put a hit out on you for $27,000. Who would do that? Did you recently fire someone? And bam, it hits Leo. I know this man. I've dealt with his anger. I've dealt with his irrational behavior. The wincing with minor movements. He's Alicia Smule's husband, Andrew. But Leo doesn't call him out on that. He does not want to anger him. He does not want to hint at the fact that he knows his identity because he's scared of what could come back. So, instead, he plays along. And about 45 minutes into this interrogation, the man steps out of the bedroom and he makes the first of about five phone calls. And these phone conversations happen outside of the bedroom as so the couple can't hear what's being said, but they can hear him. It's a very one-sided conversation because they can't hear who he is talking to, but it's a lot of yes, no, whatever. It, they, there's tension in the conversation. Short, clipped, one-word answers, intention. They are picking up on these things. This couple, even in their 60s, are very observant to what is going on. Most people in a stressful situation like that would not be able to differentiate one minute to the next. But they are latching on to these little details, okay? So when he comes back in the bedroom, the curtains are drawn, and he says something along the lines of, well, you never know, there could be a sniper out there watching us. And Leo's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the more I do research into these true crime cases, and the more I find humor in some of the stupidity that criminals think is so brilliant. And this, this story that Andrew has come up with, with him being part of the Virginia SEC and, you know, the Knights Templars, a drug cartel, and Leo had put some hit out on some imaginary person, only to find out later that there's a hit out on him for even less money. And it's kind of insulting, you know. Somebody else is worth 370000 Leo is only worth 27000 Doesn't make sense, right? This whole, this whole show, this whole display of I'm a big, bad, secret agent, bullshit. Bullshit. About an hour and a half into this interrogation, Leo is pulled up and he's made to shuffle across the hall into his personal office he has there at home. And he gets over to the computer and the man makes him sign into the private network of the firm. And at this point, this man, he has access to clients' names. He has access to very private information. He has access to everything within that network, right? So Andrew starts typing away. He's looking for something, anything. What could he use to blackmail Leo for, right? 
That's what we can assume he's trying to do. What else? Why else would he pull that up if he wasn't going to use that information for leverage, right? So after a few minutes, he slams his hands down on the keyboard, frustrated. He's pissed off. There's nothing there. Leo is clean as a whistle, right? So Leo is shoveled back into the bedroom. And at this point, Sue is becoming very worried about her husband because she can tell that Leo is kind of struggling to breathe. And he mentions something under his breath to her, but not loud enough for the guy to hear. And it's something along the lines of, I think I'm having another heart attack. Okay. Not uncommon for somebody who has had bypass surgery and is under a tremendous amount of stress. And that's where Leo is at this point. That is a lot of stress for him to be handling. And he, his poor body, it just can't take it. And so Sue says, you know, can we call an ambulance for him? Because I'm starting to get worried. If he's having another heart attack, he's already had surgery. And the guy's like, no. And so Sue says, well, I've left the oven on because I was roasting a chicken. Can I get up and go turn that off? And the guy says, I'll do it. And so Sue comes up with, I'm going to be sick. And I, it's at this point that Andrew, I guess the possibility of seeing her become sick is too gross for him and he cuts her loose and he lets her go to the bathroom so the first time she goes out to the bathroom she sees the man is flipping the outside lights on and off as if he's signaling somebody and on the second trip to the bathroom he is standing in the foyer and the front door is open and she can tell he is talking to a woman but she cannot identify that woman However, if Leo would have been the one to go across the hall to the restroom, he would be able to identify who she was, right? He knows Elysia. He's worked with her for three years. He's recognizing the husband. He's definitely going to recognize the ex-employee. So she goes back several times. And she's looking for a way to, to help her and her husband get out of this situation alive. I wanted to go ahead and insert another warning right here. The details that will be discussed during this part of the podcast are graphic in detail of violence. If this is too much for you, please skip for the next five to eight minutes of the podcast so that you do not hear any of the gruesome details. I would leave them out. However, I don't think that you would understand as a true crime nerd and listener the gravity of this case without them. So if you are sensitive to this information, please, please skip forward five to six minutes and continue the story from there. At about 9.05 p.m. on November the 9th, things start to go south fairly quickly. The man, he's not getting anywhere. So he makes Sue go back to the bathroom like she's done about a dozen times or so to be sick. He says he's going to ask her husband questions he may not answer in front of her. So Sue goes to the bathroom and the door is shut. Once Sue was out of the room, the man asked Leo if he had money in the house, specifically stacks of $20 bills equaling to the amount of $20,000 to $100,000. Leo says no. He's a lawyer, yes. He's an intellectual lawyer, uh, property lawyer. It's not a defense attorney. Um, if you are going to represent the bad guys, you're going to make a hell of a lot of money. Doing copyright, trademark, probably not making just the buku bucks. And of course, so there's no, he says no. And so the guy says, do you have gold bars in the house? And Leo says no. Then Leo says, if you will take me to the ATM, I'll withdraw all the money that I can and give it to you. And 20 or 30 seconds hesitation before Andrew pushes Leo onto the bed, pushes a pillow over his face, and proceeds to slice his neck open. Once this happens, 
You can hear Sue from the bathroom saying, Pi, are you all right? Now, Leo and Sue had very cute nicknames for one another. He was Pi and she was Muffy. And she's screaming, Pi, are you all right? And Leo screams back, Muffy, he's murdering me. And it's at this point that Sue comes out of the bathroom and she sees Andrew on top of Leo. He is stabbing and slicing at him over and over. And she screams. And the man climbs off of Leo, pulls out his weapon, and fires at Sue. He fires a Cobra 380, and the bullet is aimed at her head, but it hits at an angle and only grazes the top of it, creating just a small divot across her head before the bullet is lodged into the ceiling. This did not kill her. This was simply a graze wound. However, with the scalp being very vascular, there was a lot of blood that came with it. And Sue dove to the bed to climb over and grab the bedside telephone. The man climbs on top of Sue. Sue is face down and he proceeds to stab Sue over and over and over. And she stops moving and so he thinks she's dead. And when he, when he stops, she reaches for the phone again, and it's at this point the man stabs her in the neck and in the shoulders, and still she does not die, but she does play dead, and the man climbs off the top of her, goes over and picks up the shell casing. He looks down at Leo and says, you're going to die, and kicks him in the head. Sue gets up after Andrew leaves the bedroom and she reaches for the phone, but he took the phone with him. So she, so she gets up and she starts to make her way across the hall. She's lost a lot of blood at this point. She, you know, she has a, a, a scalp injury. She has multiple stab wounds to her upper torso in the back and her shoulders and then she's got some to her throat and Leo is on the ground and he has been cut he's been stabbed over and over and over and he also has a slice across his throat. Sue watches the man leave the home and as she's going across to the home office and there she sets off the burglar alarm and then picks up the phone in the office and calls 911. And when they answer, she simply says home invasion and gives them her address and tells them to come quickly that they are dying and they have two cats and they need to save the cats. Now, the way this burglar alarm is set up I'm assuming there's some outside security lights that are now flashing and possibly some shrill noises coming. So, and it's about 944 at this point. Uh, this wasn't a quick attack. This was, it. the details are quick sounding. He took his time. So out in front of Leo Fisher and Sue Duncan's house is Alicia in the Honda SUV and Andrew is climbing in. And, and according to multiple records, Alicia is screaming at Andrew at this point saying, who in the house is alive that could have triggered that alarm? And Andrew says he has no idea, but he cut Leo's neck and he stabbed and shot Sue. So he's not really sure how either one of these two people are still alive. It doesn't matter. Andrew shuts the door, Alicia takes off, and in a few moments, the police cruiser pulls up, the first one to respond to the 911 call. Leo has managed to get up and make his way out into the side door from the kitchen to the patio where the police officer is, and he has a pair of boxer shorts that is up against his neck to try and slow down the bleeding, and he tells him, go inside, my wife is inside and she's dying. By then, there's backup, there's EMTs, there's the ambulance, and not only is Sue being taken care of, but so is Leo, and the officer asks him, do you know by chance 
who would have done this? And Leo tells him, I know exactly who he is. His name is Andrew Schmuel, S-C-H-M-U-H-L. He spells out the name. That's his attacker. That is kind of the last thing that Leo really remembers at the home. Now, later, there will be some evidence that pops up in the trial, but one of the police officers who had gone inside to attend to his wife, at first when they found Sue, they're like, oh my God, she's dead. But then they start paying attention and they, the blood coming from the wound in her neck is pulsing, coming out in pulses, so they can see that she still has a heartbeat. And so they're trying to pack the wound to stop the bleeding. Well, one of the officers makes his way to the front of the home, into the foyer to open the front door, and he noticed there is a horrendous smell of gasoline. That was not there at 6.15 when Andrew pushed his way into the home. So 10 minutes after the call comes through and they respond to Leo Fisher and Sue Duncan's house, an APB, an all points bulletin, is issued for the couple's Honda SUV. 10 minutes later, two canine officers pull in behind a Honda SUV that is matching the description. And Alicia, she sees this, and Andrew's like, just stay calm, just, you know, don't speed, use your blinker, you know what I mean, don't give them reason to pull you over, and Alicia's like, no, they're running our plates, and Andrew, he's trying to take his clothes off, because at this point, I mean, he's covered in blood, so he's getting his clothes off, and the next thing they know, the lights light up behind the SUV, and Alicia it doesn't know what to do. And as Andrew stuffs his clothes into this plastic garbage bag, he goes to crack open the bottle of ammonia. And the ammonia, the reason they are doing this is they're trying to tamper with the DNA evidence that could be linked inside the blood. Blood does not come out very easily. Ammonia is a very strong cleaning chemical. And he is hoping that putting it all over the clothing will somehow tamper enough with forensic tests that could be done that they won't be able to identify whose blood it is. So Alicia, she's speeding along Beltway. It's the highway there. And she's weaving out and in and out of traffic. This is causing Andrew to jerk back and forth. He has not been on pain medication since prior to the break-in because he needed to be alert during this attack. And so he's starting to feel the pain. He's trying to disassemble this Cobra 380 that he had fired and shot Sue with. So he's disassembling that. His clothes reek of ammonia. The whole car reeks of ammonia because he spilt it. He is naked from the net from the head down, except for the adult diaper he has on. And just as Alicia pulls off the highway and into the parking lot of a strip mall, he downs a handful of tenodizine, the muscle relaxer that we talked about. He downloads a handful of that. And then as the car comes to the stop, he hops out of the passenger door and turns and faces the cruiser. And you can see a picture if you get online and you dig deep enough, you can find a steal from the dash cam. And Andrew is standing there with his hands up and his diaper on. Well, EMT show up to make sure that nobody is injured because there is a lot of blood. And they pull the fentanyl patch immediately off of Andrew. Because remember what I said is the moment that drug stops circulating into the body, then the effects wear off quickly. So the EMTs, they pull it off. And at this point, Andrew can't answer any questions. They ask him, you know, what'd you take? And he said, I don't know. And they're like, did you attack Leo Fisher? And he's like, I don't know. And the officers note that he's beginning to slur his words and that his eyes are kind of rolling around in his head. They're not really fixated on anything. They're just kind of rolling around and they anticipate him collapsing at any moment, either passing out or from an overdose of medication. So he is loaded into an ambulance where he is going to be transported to the local hospital. 
Alicia is removed from the vehicle, fully clothed. She's calm. She's not saying anything. I wouldn't be surprised if she's not, you know, if she's crying or not crying or whatever. If it was me, I'd be bawling my eyes out. But then again, I don't have the guts to do what they did. So she is placed into the back of another cruiser and the officer, he steps around to, I guess, help with the search of the vehicle. But Alicia in the back of the cruiser forgets there's a dash camera. And she can be heard from the back seat saying, oh my God, his computer. She's talking about Andrew's computer. Andrew had used his personal computer to research how to get away with, a, you know, research all the things that went into telling to their half-brained plan to break in and seek revenge, right? So she realizes, holy crap, there's... There's evidence out there against us. And then she says something. She doesn't think anybody hears her. But the video records her. And in the car, they start searching. And this is what they found inside. It's a slew of evidence of the torture that happened inside of the home. They find the taser. They find the discharged uh, electrodes from where he had shot Leo when he first entered the home. They find a disassembled Cobra 380 along with two clips, one of them missing one bullet, the one that was fired at Sue. They find the knife that was used to stab Leo and Sue over and over. They find credit cards. They find a pile of bloody clothing soaking in ammonia in a plastic garbage bag. They find the tizanidine pills, the muscle relaxers that Andrew had taken before jumping out of the car. They find the novelty police badge, rubber gloves, and two disposable cell phones, one of which had the battery removed and the SIM card broken half. And then they find two handwritten notes. One is in Alicia's purse, and it is in Andrew's handwriting, and it's a shopping list that says handcuffs, two bottles of NyQuil, two packs of Benadryl, one adult diaper. And, is, and then the other note is in Alicia's handwriting, and it's containing directions to the address that is next door to Leo and Sue's house. So they're both incriminating the other. Andrew, he is taken to Inova Fairfax Hospital where he's administered Narcan and the moment Narcan goes into the system, it starts to reverse the effects of narcotic medication or drugs. So the slurring Andrew, his he's starting to improve. He's starting to become coherent. He's starting to be able to enunciate his words correctly. And the hospital staff find the second fentanyl patch he had placed on himself underneath the adult diaper. So when he got out, it looked like, oh, hey, look, there's the patch. Take that off. It's going to reverse these effects, whatever. What they did not realize, because they did not make him take the diaper off, was that he had put a second patch on so that he still had the continuous fentanyl drug running through him which also helped him not be coherent when they finally got him in the back of the ambulance. At the same hospital, Leo and Sue are in the trauma rooms and doctors and hospital staff are trying to save Leo and Sue. And the last thing Leo says he can remember in the hospital was telling them to save his wife, you know, save her. And he can remember feeling them cut away his pants with scissors. Sue says the last thing that she remembers is the staple gun as they tried to close the wound in her head. And she said it went bam, bam, bam with each staple that went into her head. So you've got them trying to save the very people that the other man that was brought in by police tried to kill. Very, very chaotic situation in the emergency room that night. 
11 days later, Andrew is still being held in jail. He has now been charged with two counts of abduction with the intent to gain with the intent to gain benefit, two counts of aggravated malicious wounding, two counts of using or displaying a firearm during the commission of an aggravated malicious wounding, and burglary while armed with a deadly weapon. Alicia is being held in jail on five counts. Two counts of aggravated malicious wounding, two counts of abduction, and one count of burglary with a deadly weapon. Both of them are indicted on charges, and the prosecution decides to separate them and charge them by themselves. Both Alicia and Andrew were being held without bond. On May 16th of 2016, Andrew took his chance with a trial and jury. He claimed involuntary toxic intoxication and he suffered a medication-induced delirium. Essentially, he was saying he was not in control of what happened that night during the interrogation and attempted murder of Leo Fisher and Sue Duncan. Unofficially, he's looking for a loophole. The judge does deny Andrew's defense of involuntary intoxication, stating that since Andrew was not claiming insanity and just the intoxication, it does not constitute the same dispute that an insanity plea does. This is the major concern going forth with Andrew in his appeals process. His last appeal was issued September 11th of 2018, where he said that the, the judge dismissed his claim of involuntary intoxication with a medication-induced delirium, and he had her expert witnesses that could attest to Andrew and his condition that night. Leo and Sue both get on stand and testify that Andrew did not seem intoxicated. He did not seem like he was under the influence of medications, and they had to relive that horrible night in 2014. Andrew was also starting to claim that his wife was emotionally abusive to him and forced him into the situation against his will. Now this is the thing about this couple. Once they were separated, once one was arrested immediately and one was arrested once he got to the hospital, these two started singing like canaries. Only their stories did not line up. What they were doing was Andrew made me do it. Alicia made me do it. They were doing nothing but pointing the finger at the other person. This is not good. They had a rocky marriage from the moment Andrew had to take medical discharge from the army. And it just got worse from there. And by the time they had decided they were going to commit this revenge act, they were not a united front. They are not your Bonnie and Clyde. They are your Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Andrew does stand up and take the stand in his own defense, claiming it's not that he did not commit the crime, but instead he cannot remember committing these acts against the couple. He was stuck on this involuntary intoxication defense. Whatever it is about this, he swears he can get off with it, right? He, he's, he practiced law. He went to law school. He has a law degree. He should know something, right? Well, you should also know that once it's been dismissed because they can cite case after case after case saying it did not stand up here. It's not going to stand up here. You know, but he knows everything. He's the, the old, great, powerful law student. Right before the end of the trial, prosecution told the jury that before the attack Andrew learned a little bit of information. He was behind $18,000 in alimony. His wife had lost her job. She couldn't pay his alimony. He only brought in $1,100 a month. He couldn't pay the back alimony. But if Mr. Fisher had stacks of 20s in the amount of $20,000, well, he could have paid off his back alimony to his first wife. In the end, on June 15th of 2016, Andrew Schmuel was convicted of all seven counts he was indicted on. Guilty, 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 right? 
And on June 17th of 2016, Andrew was sentenced to two terms of life in prison plus 98 years. Here's the thing, Andrew. Prison does not have a tub. So your three hours that you needed every morning to soak, eh, it's not going to happen. I don't know what kind of medication relief you're going to get with your continuous pain, but I can guarantee you it's not anything close to what you were getting in the outside free world. On September 20th of 2016, Alicia pled guilty to five charges that she was indicted on. She took a plea deal, and by taking this plea deal, it offered a 45-year sentence. Had she not taken that plea deal, she faced life in prison just like her husband. Her sentencing trial was set on to January of 2017, and on January 17th of 2017, Alicia was sentenced to 45 years, a sentence that came with the deal. The judge did not decrease it or increase it. Alicia did take the stand during the sentencing trial and apologized to Leo and Sue, saying that she was abused by her husband and subservient to his commands, quoting, I wish that I had done something to prevent it, end quote. Years later, Leo still gets up every morning and goes into the firm. A man that was once kind-hearted now has anger and is leery of others, reluctant to reach out and help as he once did. Sue is still in retirement, although she doesn't live life without residual trauma. She spends most of her time in her home with the couple's two cats. She still roasts chicken, but the shrill of the doorbell causes a moment of hesitation. Neither are able to relax, neither are scar-free emotionally or physically. Both are determined to move on with their life and strive every day to leave that horrible fall night behind them. Andrew and Alicia are both incarcerated, and Andrew is exhausting his appeal still headstrong that due to the amount of medication he was on meant that theoretically he isn't at fault. Alicia, she is quieter, serving her time without making waves. She could one day see the sunlight from the other side of the fence, and that thought is the one she holds on to. Not every true crime case ends with murder. Sometimes it's those that leave survivors behind that leave the biggest, darkest, and most gruesome scars. Revenge is a dish best served cold, but in this case, it wasn't the schmoodles serving the dish, but Leo Fisher and Sue Duncan. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we take a look at a different kind of case. A case where no one dies, a case that didn't go unsolved, but in every detail is still a true crime case that will still shake you to your core. As always, I will leave you with one last line. Revenge is always the weak pleasure of a little and narrow mind. Much love, the true crime librarian. <laughs>